Good. Oh, that's better. Well, wow, I can tell. <laughs> Put this back in the right pocket. Sorry about this. Got to find the pocket. I think we made it. Hooray. <laughs> oh, gosh. Please, please do sit down for a moment because we've got quite a few things um, to do before we actually start the, the worship this morning. So first of all, a few practical things. I've had to write them all down or else I'll forget. This week, Lent is going to begin. Before that, we have Shrove, Shrove Tuesday, the launch of the Lent Appeal, and it'll be seven o'clock in St John's Church Hall here. And uh, we're going to be uh, visited by someone called Bless and Babu, who's from the City of Sanctuary, which is the charity we're supporting for Lent this year. So he'll go he's going to come along and explain more about the charity and hopefully show us some pictures and give us a presentation about that charity. There will be refreshments. Do have your tea before you come, but make room for some pudding because we'll have refreshments and that's from seven o'clock onwards on Tuesday, the 1st of March, Shrove Tuesday. And if you've not signed up already and you want to come, there is still time. Today's the last day and you'll find a list at the back of church. So everyone's welcome to that. On Ash Wednesday, there are going to be two services. There's going to be one here at 10 o'clock in the morning and also one at Holy Trinity at 7.30 p.m. And with, with both, it'll be a communion service with imposition of ashes. After today, uh, we're heading towards preparing for the reordering of St. John's. And so the church will be open on Monday and Tuesday, and then Wednesday for the service. But after that, it's going to be closed in preparation for the building work beginning on the 7th of March. So just to let you know that that's the, the, the date and the plans. So that means that services after today will all be at Holy Trinity except for the fourth Sunday in the month during the building work period. So the next service on this site will be on the 27th of March in St John's Church Hall. And then for the following probably two months, fourth Sunday of the month at St John's Church Hall, but the remainder at Holy Trinity Church. In preparation for the building work, as you know, the, the pews uh, have been offered for sale and uh, especially the long pews, um, you need a big house, don't you, for these long pews or, or a, a garden. Uh, there are still some available, so please let Vanessa know if you would like to um, put in a bid for one of them. There's also a great collection of umbrellas and gloves and a glass platter and all sorts of things at the back of church that have not been claimed. So please do have a look there in case any of those things are yours, because if they're not taken today, then they'll be taken to a charity shop. So I think that's all of the practical things. We're really grateful to Nigel Harwood, who's going to preach today for us, really looking forward to hearing his sermon today. And today we'll join with others around the world in praying for the situation in Ukraine. And so now to two bits of, um, one bit of very sad news and then some information. Betty Grayson, passed away peacefully on the morning of 25th of February. And Margaret Minns wrote that Betty was also a member of the Mother's Union and at one time secretary. She'd been in Meadowgrange nursing home at Holmesfield for the last few years, where she was very happy and well cared for. A funeral's going to be at Hutcliffe Wood Crematorium on 23rd of March at 11 o'clock and her family will be pleased to see her friends from St John's if they wish to attend. So that's uh, Betty Grayson, so may Betty rest in peace. David Cunnington's daughter-in-law told us that David has been in hospital, the Royal Hallamshire. He's doing okay, responding to treatments, 
and there's talk of him going to a nursing home for a few weeks before going home with a care package in place. And so we're asked to pray for David. The final thing is that Vanessa mentioned that we'd like to do a tribute this week and a, a memorial really of, of Alan, Alan Burt. So now's the time to hand over to Vanessa to do that. So, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, Alan decided he didn't want to have a funeral, but we didn't want to let the time pass without making our own tribute to him. Um, although I knew Alan in church, for the time that he was worshipping up at John's, there's a whole lot of his life that I didn't know about. So I'm not here to do any kind of eulogy. I wouldn't have enough information to tell you all of that but what I can share with you is what you all thought about him so you might remember a couple of weeks ago I asked you to write down what Alan meant to you so I'm just going to read out what people said I haven't got quite enough hands for this okay a man willing to put his hand to help anybody in so many ways a good Samaritan, a wonderful warm presence wherever he went, cheerful, affable, committed. Welcome smile, especially to newcomers, loyal and faithful servant to this church and the whole parish. Thoughtful, patient, hardworking, good listener, one with his dog, conscientious a good friend and a very good church warden, a true Christian, good sense of humor, a lovely man to know. Frequently saw Alan when out driving, he in his sporty sports car, very jaunty in appearance, the eternal Peter Pan. I know Sarah is listening, so I hope some of these are gonna make her smile. A joyful, friendly man with a sports car, a sports car. always there to welcome you. When I became a church warden, Alan was a welcoming, cheerful help. Very much missed, he was always there to greet people, then he was gone. He was good enough to give his time to talk to Mother's Union of his work and commitment to the Samaritans. A great welcomer to the church service, he will be missed in our hearts. A very caring man, a true Christian, Jolly, organized, handsome. Now, st not strangely, because of course he was a handsome man, that came from one of my daughters. <laughs> Friendly, youthful, welcoming, urbane. Now, if you don't know what urbane means, rather than scurrying for the dictionary, I will tell you it means courteous and refined in manner, which I think is a very good description of Alan. Energetic, lively listener and encourager, friendly. A fantastic church warden, always incredibly kind and helpful. He kept things in perspective and his stock phrase was, I don't know what all the fuss is about. He had a great sense of humor and a tremendous work ethic. Always interested in other people and had a great zest for life. He loved his whiskey and his red MG sports car. And that was from Helen Blackburn who used to be the, the priest here who was intending to come today, but has been attacked by COVID. Always a gentleman, naughty sense of humor, distinctive voice, caring, kind, MG sports car. Good, interesting company, always sartorially impeccable, well-mannered, reliable, direct and candid, approachable, willing to put himself forward for the benefit of others, for example, his work with the Samaritans and local hospital radio, a jazz lover. Honest, bonhomme, straight talking, energetic, chatty, charming, good company, mischievous, funny, young at heart, affable, and the life and soul. These are the things that the congregation, his friends at St. John's thought about him, 
and I've created, I'm super impressed with myself for doing this. There were a few words that went on, what we call a word cloud. Okay, so the more times things were mentioned, the bigger the word, and you can see welcoming is the biggest one there. There are some small versions of this at the back on either side. If anybody wants to take a little one when they leave as a reminder of what Alan meant, then please do. So finally, I'm just going to say a short prayer and then we'll finish. Lord, we take a moment this morning to give thanks for the life of our friend, Alan Burt, who died in January. We have heard him described in the words of people who knew and loved him throughout his years of service and friendship in the church family here at St. John's and in the parish of Abbeydale and Millhouses, in whose creation he believed so strongly. We pray for Alan's wife, Sarah, for his children and grandchildren, for all his family and friends as they adjust to life without him. And just for a moment, let each of us picture Alan in the way we like best, walking his dog, driving his MG, as a charming host, an efficient church warden, teasing or welcoming us to church on a Sunday morning. <coughs> Lord, we miss Alan, but we believe that he rests forever in peace with you. Amen. Thank you, Vanessa, and thank you to everyone who wrote those wonderful words about Alan, and may he rest in peace. And so we begin our worship now today by singing together hymn number 306, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, hymn 306. Let us kneel or sit for our prayers of preparation. Almighty God, 
to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against you. Have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The collect for today, the Sunday next before Lent. Almighty Father, whose Son was revealed in majesty before he suffered death upon the cross, give us grace to perceive his glory, that we may be strengthened to suffer with him and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Exodus. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses spoke with them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. 
When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. This is the word of the Lord. Second reading is from Corinthians. Since then we have such a hope, we act with great boldness, not like Moses, who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside. But their minds were hardened. Indeed, to this very day, when they hear the reading of the Old Covenant, that same veil is still there, since only Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. This is the word of the Lord. Our gradual hymn is number 416, Lord, the light of your love is shining, 416.
with him Peter and John and James, and went upon the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who were stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter did not know what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and the disciples kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It throws him into convulsions until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. The word transfiguration is defined as a complete change of form or appearance into a more beautiful or spiritual state. Transfigure is defined as to transform into something more beautiful and elevated. To be transfigured, then, is to be changed, changed for the better. In their different ways, our readings today all show the power of God and Christ to effect a change for the better in our own lives and in the lives of others. After his encounter with God on Mount Sinai, Moses' face shone, so much so that he was obliged to cover his face upon coming down from the mountain and rejoining his people. During Jesus's transfiguration, his appearance changed and his divinity was revealed to his disciples. And of course, Jesus can also make a change in our own lives in turn, affirmed by Paul in the Corinthians reading, in which he explains that the veil of blindness and unbelief can be taken away from Jew and Gentile alike enabling Christ to bring about something more beautiful and elevated in us. Following on from these readings then, let us contemplate the power of Christ to effect a transfiguration in our own lives. We see in the gospel reading how Jesus speaks with Moses and Elijah about his departure 
which he was going to fulfill at Jerusalem. In his commentary on this passage, Tom Wright explains how the Greek word Luke uses for departure is exodus, then describes the different senses in which Luke is using the word. In one sense, Luke is using exodus to mean leaving to go on a journey, since Jesus will leave the mountain of transfiguration to go to Jerusalem. But Tom Wright explains that the connection Luke wants his readers to make is between an old and a new exodus. In the original exodus, Moses led an exodus out of Egypt and a life of slavery into the promised land. And in the new exodus, Christ would lead his followers out of a life of sin and death into a new life. So we have the opportunity for a new life, for our old lives to be transformed and transfigured into something beautiful, to be truly changed. However, we have to be willing to go on this exodus, this journey away from sin and death with Christ. And in order to do that, we have first to be prepared to see ourselves for who we really are. Once we do so, Christ can transform and transfigure us. Some people may believe or pretend they don't need to be changed or transformed. Other people may have a very different reaction, being all too aware of their failings and shortcomings, feeling that Christ's job will be too great to affect the change in their lives which is needed. Earlier in his gospel, Luke tells us how, when Peter first met Christ and saw and felt his power, his first response was to implore Christ to leave. Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. In his grace and mercy, though, Jesus didn't leave. Instead, he transformed Peter, who followed him and accomplished glorious things, things that Peter would never have thought himself capable of. And so, whatever our shortcomings, like Peter, we can experience our own transfiguration. Christ first shows us himself, and then ourselves, with all our faults. He shows us who he is, who we are, and then finally, who and what we can be with his help. This process of realization of who we are and who we can be through the transformative power of Christ may happen slowly or quickly. In the gospel reading, Peter, James and John see Christ's glory in an instant as they wake up. And in the Corinthians reading, Paul also talks about a sudden revelation. Paul says that when those who were metaphorically blind or in denial of the power of Christ, turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Another beautifully poetic way of describing this moment is by saying the scales fell from their eyes, which is what happened both literally and metaphorically to Paul, or Saul, as he then was, persecutor of Christians until his own conversion. We read about Paul's conversion in the book of Acts. Blinded by Christ, as he was traveling on the road to Damascus, Saul is led by his travel companions into the city and waits there for three days, remaining blind. After three days, a Christian called Ananias is told by the Lord to go to Saul and lay his hands upon him. Here is how Luke describes what happened. So Ananias entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales from, fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And in the synagogues immediately, he proclaimed Jesus saying, he is the son of God. So like Saul, when we become a Christian, when we're transfigured, the scales fall from our eyes. We come to see things as they really are. We see our lives in a different way. And what we see may not be a pretty sight. 
We might see a life where our priorities are all wrong. We may see selfishness, pride, any number of things we need to change. Speaking about the contrast between Christ and us, William Barclay explains that Jesus always asked, what does God wish me to do? While we nearly always ask, what do I want to do? So we see the need to be transfigured just as Christ was transfigured. We're transfigured and like Saul, we're converted. But what then? We change. And we show the world we've changed in and through our behavior. We minister. We see from all three accounts of the transfiguration in the gospels that Peter wants to prolong the mountaintop experience to savor the profoundly spiritual experience of being in close communion with God. But all three gospel writers immediately follow their account of the transfiguration with Jesus and the disciples descending the mountain to be met by desperate pleas for help from the father of a child tormented by a demon. Neither Jesus nor his disciples could stay on the mountain communing with God forever. Their mission was to take Christ into the world, preaching, healing, and doing good works. In the same way, after our own experiences of transfiguration and conversion, we are sent out to walk with Christ in our daily lives and to minister to the world with the help of the Holy Spirit and in the power of Christ. So transfiguration, then conversion, then ministry. I'd like to close with two short prayers to help us ask Christ to his, enact his transfiguration in our hearts and then to walk with us and act through us in our daily lives. For the first prayer, I've taken some words from St. Patrick's breastplate. Let us pray. Christ, when I lie down, Christ, when I sit down, Christ, when I arise, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. And our second closing prayer, God our Father, may the light of faith illumine our hearts and shine in our words and deeds. May Christ transfigure our hearts, our lives, our words and our deeds. Amen. Let us stand to declare our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father,
Let us kneel or sit for our prayers. Blessed are you, creator of all. To you be praise and glory forever. We thank you, Father, for your gift of another day. We pray to realize in all we do your presence with us, your guidance of us, your forgiveness when we allow ourselves to be distracted and forget to listen to your voice. We offer ourselves to you to see and hear and do as you would have us do, as we journey through the day. Transfigure us then, O Lord, transfigure us. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father of mercies, we bring before you the needs of your people here in this world. We pray for your blessing on our bishops, Pete and Sophie, upon all the clergy and upon your faithful people who seek to serve you and others. We pray for your blessing on our parish and that we shall soon have again a priest to guide us as we seek the renewal of our churches by reaching out to all around us and bringing them into a new vision of the faith we have in Jesus our Lord. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for Christian people facing persecution and often the extinction of ancient dioceses in the Middle East. <clears throat> Give them courage in the face of what is happening at the hands of fanatics. We pray that the peoples of the Abrahamic faiths will once more live in harmony and peace with one another, sharing our visions of you and your truth. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Eternal Father, you have created our world and redeemed us from sin and evil. We hold today before your mercy seat the peoples of Ukraine and of Russia and ask you to guide the leaders of all the nations involved to secure a lasting peace which will benefit all concerned. In a moment of silence, let us think about what is happening there at this time and offer our prayer to you on our on their behalf. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, look kindly upon the leaders of our local communities and of the parliaments and government of the nation at large. May they be prepared to listen and then seek to reach out to help and bless their peoples, your peoples. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. With a heavy heart, but with hope too, we look upon the needs of ordinary people here who are finding it difficult to feed, to clothe, and to house their families, particularly where there are children. Show us how we all can help. We also remember that so many peoples across our world live in poverty, in terrible need, often facing persecution and war. Many seek refuge by leaving their homes and seeking safer and better lives. We pray that you will open our eyes to their needs, to see them as fellow human beings and to welcome them and help them, for they are our brothers, our sisters, all your children, 
all your creation. Lord, in your mercy. Let us now think about those known to us who have died or in any kind of need and pray for them. We think of David Cunnington, particularly in hospital and recovering um, at this time. Let's take a moment of silence and hold before our loving Father people known to us as being in any kind of need at this time. Lord, in your mercy. And we remember now before you, our Father God, those who have died. We pray for Betty Grayson. May those who have died now be at peace in your love, in your mercy, in your kindness to them. And at this time of sadness for so many families, we ask you to comfort those left behind here as they mourn their loss. May they find hope in your promises made clear to us by your Son, Jesus Christ, and by your Holy Spirit. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Would you like to stand, if you're able, for the peace? Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. We're going to sing now our next hymn. It's number 79, Bright the Vision that Delighted, Once the Sight of Judah's Seer. It's number 79.
Would you like to kneel or sit for our Eucharistic prayer? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, you made the world and love your creation. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you, with saints and angels praising you and singing. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again, he praised you, gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Lord of all life, Help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people, gather us into your loving arms and bring us with John and all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, O loving Father, forever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. 
Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father.
let us pray. Holy God, we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. May we who are partakers at this table reflect his life in word and deed, that all the world may know his power to change and save. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Before the blessing, just two more things to say. First of all, thank you, Nigel, for preaching this morning. You wouldn't think that was the first sermon you'd ever preached. Thank you so much for those words. Another person who's been in ministry for a long time, and we really appreciate his ministry, especially now is Mike, who very secretly, unknown to me, was 80 on Thursday. And so, well, Mike, we'd like to thank you for all of your ongoing ministry. And we'd also like to wish you a happy birthday three days late in the traditional way. Happy birthday. And so now let us pray for God's blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Let's stand now to sing our final hymn. Number 401, Longing for Light, hymn 401.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.